Don't they see what has happened to the Iranian people? Do they want to strengthen that evil regime that is gunning down protesters and slaughtering women and imprisoning people? It is so immoral that there are no words to describe it. That Trump should attack DeSantis was stupid. It just makes no sense other than his crazy ego. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thank you for joining us. Today, we have one of our favorite guests, JNS and Jerusalem Post columnist Ruthie Bloom, back for another special appearance to break down what happened in the elections in both Israel and the United States and what we can expect going forward. But before we start, I want to encourage everyone to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. Also, we'd love to hear from you. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. We also want you to be aware that you don't have to wait a full week for more top story analysis. I am now offering a daily top story podcast so that I can share with you more news and analysis about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find the daily show under... Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And now to today's program. In the last two weeks, both Israel and the United States have held elections. In each case, the results were somewhat surprising. In Israel, the pundits and the pollsters were for the most part predicting another stalemate. That would mean Yair Lapid would remain as interim prime minister for another several months and a sixth election on the horizon. Instead, Benjamin Netanyahu and his Likud party, along with his religious party allies, won a decisive victory, finally ending the three and a half year long standoff. And unless something really unexpected happens in the negotiations over cabinet posts, it will mean a right-wing religious party coalition, leaving the parties of the left and the Arab parties completely out of power after effectively shutting the right out of power in the last year. That in particular, the likelihood that religious Zionist party leaders Betzal Smotrich and Itamar Ben-Gavir will get important ministries, has set the hair of many on Israel's left and that of their American counterparts on fire with many claiming that this means the old good Israel is dead and now we're faced with a new bad Israel. But what will this government actually do? Can it really reign in an out of control and unaccountable Israeli judiciary? Can it re rectify a terrible security and crime situation inside Israel and follow up with more diplomatic triumphs in the Arab world as Netanyahu did when he was last in office? How will it cope with a Biden administration that is still determined to appease Iran and far more interested in the war against Russia in Ukraine than expanding the circle of peace in the Middle East? And will the demands of Smotrich, Ben Gvir, and the Haredi parties to change the law of return and or alter recognition of non-Orthodox conversions aggravate relations with liberal and American Jews who are already rattled by uh, some of the misleading and partisan leftist accusations about the Israeli right being against democracy? Will the prospect of a solid majority for Netanyahu mean at least a few years of political calm in Israel, or is that hoping for too much? At the same time, the midterms in the U.S. also didn't turn out as expected, with a predicted red wave for the Republicans turning into a surprising retention of the Senate for the Democrats and an even more surprising, very narrow win of the House of Representatives for the Republicans. What were the main factors that led to this outcome? And what does that mean for the next two years in terms of continued divided government in Washington? How will this impact foreign policy and the U.S.-Israel relationship? And it's also time to start handicapping the 2024 race with Donald Trump reportedly about to announce another run for the presidency while trashing the big GOP winner of the midterms, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. 
And does this ensure that Joe Biden runs for re-election rather than being pressured to stand down as so many thought likely when it seemed as if his own popularity and incompetence were going to cost the Democrats Congress? To break all of this down, I'm very happy to have my good friend, columnist Ruthie Bloom, whose astute political analyses appears twice a week in JNS. Ruthie is the author of To Hell in a Handbasket about uh, Iran. Ruthie Bloom, welcome to Top Story. Thanks for having me again, Jonathan. Well, it's great to have you back. You're, you're you know, uh, among our favorite guests and um, perfect for us to break down the two elections that, that we've had in the last couple of weeks and everything that's happening. Let's start um, with what happened um, today, actually, as we, um, you know, the day that we're taping was the day that the Knesset was sworn in. Give that's us right. a sense of how, um, how that played out and uh, sort of how that, uh, you know, sets up what's about to happen. Okay, well, normally the ceremony of the swearing in of the Knesset is very uh, sort of exciting. You know, a lot of the new members are excited to be part of the parliament. And, you know, they each wears a uh, sort of flower pin on his or her lapel. And it's very um, ceremonial and their speeches and they bring their families. But today, a few hours before the ceremony, there was a terrible terrorist attack in Ariel, in Judea and Samaria, and otherwise known as the West Bank. So it really cast a pall on the proceedings, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it provided uh, certain political figures with the ammunition to say, you see, this is why we needed to elect the current government that's in formation right mm. now. Right. So this is uh, short on hearts and flowers and uh, ceremonial, um, and the, the, the rhetorical combat began right away, is what you're saying. Naturally, it's Israel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and in that so, backdrop, uh, may I say, one, I want to add mm -hmm. just one point. Part of the ceremony, before they arrive into the plenum hall, um, each member comes up and it has a photo taken next to the Israeli flag. Um, it's, you know, each one has his, has a kind of, mm -hmm. it's a standard photo. And two members of the, of Ayman Ode's, what used to be called the joint list, the joint Arab list, one a Jew and one an Arab, one in uh, the Hadash party, uh, refused to have their pictures taken. Which is the Israeli, Israeli Communist flag. Party. You're right, the Communist Party, Communist, and it joined with an Arab Islamist party, and they refused to have their photos taken next to the flag of the state that they represent, that they're just about to be sworn into its parliament. Mm -hmm. So that pretty much clarifies the conflict, you know, sort of in a nutshell, doesn't it? It does, actually, yes. So now that the Knesset is sworn in um, and the, um, you know, and the rhetorical fight is on, Tell us exactly what's going to follow now. How, you know, obviously Netanyahu um, has uh, the mandate to form a government, but he still has to make his agreement with the um, three parties that were elected to be his partners. And um, that may not be so simple as just a uh, sign on the dotted line, right? Oh, no, it's not simple at all, but I wouldn't necessarily make uh, much of it. Uh, it was to be expected. It always happens during uh, coalition negotiations. And one of the reasons for this is, and in particularly in the current case, is that it's all well and good for Netanyahu to need to give good ministries to uh, the parties that are part of the coalition. Um, but actually his own party, Likud, is the largest party not only in the coalition, but in the entire Knesset. So if he doles out the choice ministries to the smaller parties in his coalition, his own part, his own party said, whoa, wait a minute here. What about us? We actually are more important. So it has been so traditionally the idea is that the certain choice ministries, those which is to say defense, 
uh, Treasury and Foreign Ministry are considered the choice, the most important or choice ministries. And there's a battle going on over that because the Religious Zionist Party wants uh, two of those ministries. They want either um, either defense and or um, finance. And so that's where that's why there's an impasse right now. And there are other issues going on now, and we don't know for sure, but these rumor has it. For example, here's a good example. The foreign ministry. Um, it was rumored that, that Netanyahu wanted to appoint Ron Dermer, the former ambassador to the United States, um, as foreign minister. But Ron Dermer is not a member of the Knesset, so he didn't run for any office. And it's possible that if he were, that if Netanyahu were to do this, Likud uh, Knesset members would not be happy, and not because they don't admire Ron Dermer, but because they actually ran for office and actually got elected, and I think would feel slighted if he if Dermer got that position. So yeah, I mean that, that's an interesting. It's an interesting distinction for our reader, for our, our our audience to understand if they're not that familiar with how Israel's parliamentary system works. In a parliamentary system, the members of the cabinet are not experts or so-called experts as they are in the United States, appointed Correct. to to run you know the in the Department of Defense or the State Department or any of the others. I mean, obviously, a lot of them times, you know, certainly I would say this current administration, they're not really experts. But they're people who are brought in. Uh, but in a parliamentary system, members of parliament are the ministers because and and the you know the conceit behind that is that members of parliament are responsible to parliament and you know can be halt, you know basically can be questioned in a way and held accountable in a way. Now, Israel has adopted a system in recent years where members uh, you know where ministers can resign from the Knesset, someone else gets their seat, but they still continue. As minister, so that kind of dilutes, you know, this. It's system. what we you call. Know, it's, it was based on the Norwegian system, right. <laughs> and so, so what's funny is when you hear um, Israelis talk about it, they say uh, they'll name certain Knesset members and say, and they'll be Norwegian. <laughs> right. There's it's not Norwegian. something actually in the. In the British system, you know, which is the most familiar parliamentary system, that's not what happens. If you're, you right. know, ministers have to be members of parliament and the right. assistant ministers have to be members of parliament right. because they can be forced to answer questions by the opposition. Israel is a little more loosey-goosey. So in a sense, I can see where Netanyahu thinks he could get away with, you know, sort of uh, giving it to Dermer. And I think the reason why he wants to is pretty obvious um, yes, you know when you speak of getting choice ministries, he does. You know he's Netanyahu has always been his own foreign minister, and to a certain extent, you know, as as long unless he has to give it to a rival or a member of a rival party in a coalition, like somebody like Benny Gantz in their brief partnership, um, he's sort of his own defense minister too. So um, you know, giving it to Dermer, who is easily the closest person in Israel to Netanyahu other than his immediate family. I mean, you know, they're very, very Dermer close. is definitely his right-hand man, yes. Exactly, and always has been. Sometimes they always call him Bibi's been. brain, which is, you right. know, a little nonsensical. Right. Bibi's got a pretty good brain of his own, whether you like him or don't like him. But it's, you know, when in, the dynamic here that you've laid out for us, I think is interesting, um, is you talk about members of the Likud not being happy and the demands being made by members of the religious Zionist party, as well as of Shas and, uh, you know, the United Torah Judaism, the two Haredi parties. Um, right. They all have their demands. They all have their, you know, they all want to be satisfied by Netanyahu. He doesn't want to, you know, be in a dispute with them. On the other hand, there's much less leverage by everybody right now, you know, as, as opposed to um, some of the past, uh, periods when coalitions are assembled, because everybody knows what the coalition is going to be. Um, Netanyahu doesn't seem to have an option to go outside of his three allies and to say to, you know, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, either you take what you get and you'll like it, or otherwise I'll, you know, do a deal with Benny Gantz. take Gons a hike, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Do that doesn't seem to be an option now, does it? No, um, 
And I'll tell you, there's a lot of media hype about uh, how Netanyahu and Smotrich, who's the head of the religious Zionism party, how they haven't spoken in several days. You know, a lot of this is hype. It's true that there are disputes. At the moment, I think that they are being overplayed. Another interesting element here is that two people vying for the finance ministry have opposite politics when it comes to the economy. One is the head of the Shas party, Arya Derry, and the other is Smotrich. Again, that's one of the ministries that he says, if I don't get defense, I'd like finance. Derry is an out-and-out socialist. He, he, wants to, uh, he wants to start a system of food stamps. He believes in handouts. He believes in, you know, handing uh, for giving child allowances and all kinds of benefits. He, he wants to spend people. more government money to satisfy his constituents. He's, in a sense, yes, he's more but, popular. You know, just in fairness to him, in fairness to him, it's not only satisfying his constituency. It's satisfying a lot of other people, too, okay? This is mm -hmm, traditionally sure. in Israel, until Netanyahu uh, years ago put a semi-stop to it. We, uh, all Israelis, enjoyed these, if you had four children, you got this much money, and every time you gave birth in the hospital, you got a check, so you could, you know, it, it was handouts, okay? And it wasn't just to his constituents. It, this is, was traditionally a very socialist policy. Smotrich, on the other hand, now these are both, for people who don't understand, these are both orthodox people, okay? Smotrich is orthodox, and so is Derry. But Derry is a socialist, and Smotrich is more of a libertarian, but in any case, he's a capitalist. In other words, he wants to combat labor unions, he wants to privatize the ports, he wants to break the stranglehold that teachers and the histadrut, the, the, the uh, umbrella uh, labor union, the histadrut, the, the stranglehold that it has over everybody. And so he and Derry couldn't be more different. So, of now, course... Now, in this sense, yeah. you know, Smotrich appears to be kind of cut from the same cloth as Netanyahu. Yes. Who helped transform the Likud to a certain extent. Netanyahu, Absolutely. I think, rightly call the Likud um, kind of a Peronist party after, you know, Juan Perón and, you know, what went yeah. on in, in Argentina in that, uh, you know, the Likud of, of, of Menachem Begin, um, you know, it was very tough on, on territory. It was right wing in terms of foreign and defense policy, but it wasn't what we think of as right wing on economic policy. It was a very populist no. um, party, very much in tune in some ways um, with uh, the, the, you know, what we would consider more left-wing positions on economics. Right. And by the way, the faction, there was the liberal faction in the Likud that was always capitalist. And one of the reasons I can tell you that I, I noticed in the different rhetoric between America and Israel, one of the reasons that we don't use the word, we tend not to talk about liberals and conservatives the way Americans do. We say left and right is because when you say liberal in Hebrew, you mean capitalist, okay? Mm -hmm. So Well, that's sort of, just, yeah, in Israel, sort of like 19th century um, liberal. Right, you know, exactly. Is, and because it, there was what you call the liberalim of the Likud, those were the free right. market economy people. So, yes. the, and, and also when you say conservative here, it doesn't really... You, you can say it, but it, it doesn't have the right connotation. That's why we always say left and right. And I find that in English, sometimes when I do that, when I'm in the United States, uh, people say, well, they're not really left wing or they're not really right wing. So they get uncomfortable with the words left and right and prefer liberal and conservative. Yeah, but it's Israel and the United States are two different countries, yes, two different definitely. political cultures, um, yeah. which sometimes I think a lot of American Jews um, don't, don't understand. Well, you, you set that up. Obviously, that's an interesting, you know, uh, dilemma for Netanyahu, Smotrich or Derry. He needs them both. He, you know, he can't blow either of them off. Um, it is, though, very difficult to imagine him giving def the defense ministry to someone without any 
security background, which certainly Smotrich doesn't have. And, you know, that that's a real problem. You know, he, well, we he have, wants I to have govern, to say one thing on, not just to make just a coalition. I have to say one thing about that. Smotrich at least has been a minister. He was a really good transportation minister. He has um, parliamentary experience. And it is true that he doesn't have a defense background. But neither did Shimon Peres and neither did Moshe Arendt. Israel has had defense ministers who were not the typical general, you know, the five-star general. That's true. But the two that you cite, Peres and Arendt, both had background. They certainly didn't have military backgrounds. They were not right. officers. And they were not right. ex-generals the way Israelis like Correct. to, you know, parachute their generals into politics. But Correct. both had a defense background. I mean, Arendt okay. was... was Aaron's and certainly Perez helped organize so much of the defense ministry for Ben Gurion, and Aaron's was you know deeply involved in as an no, aerospace engineer. True. And that's so, true. but you know, Smotrich doesn't have that either. No, as well as you know, no no ex general you know no generals epaulets uh, to, to 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 boast of. No, that's absolutely true. But also, but there's another thing is that Smotrich is playing a game here. He says. If you don't give me finance, I want defense. See, I think what he's, he, I think he knows he can't get defense. And this is his, he's like, he's, this is part of his tactic. Now, as I said, I would far prefer to have him have finance than dairy because of the socialism issue. A lot of Israelis don't want dairy as finance minister because he had, um, he He's was a convicted already felon? in jail for, for yeah, <laughs> tax evasion. Corruption, and like that. yes. Yeah, for So, you know, they don't feel comfortable with that, and they think he's he wants his, his hand on the till in order to, to appease his base. And as I said, listen, Shelly Yechimovich, who was once the head of the Labour Party, a very left-wing woman, uh, polit- former politician and journalist, actually said she supports dairy being... <laughs> finance minister and that's because of his socialism so you know there yeah. there yeah. i have a clear well, opinion you know you sure. reshuffle the deck on these things i mean it, it can be yes so, it's tricky um, but i guess what i handicap for is who might actually get the defense and foreign ministries i mean if it's not going to be dermer who well, is he going to give foreign, it to who can he trust be, there are other a couple of himself. other candidates there are a couple of other candidates one is amir ohana a Likud member, a Likud, who was he sir he has served as justice minister and as public security minister in past government. Amir Ohana is gay. He is gay with a partner, and they have twin children, and they live in Tel Aviv. And he's also extremely well spoken, smart. He's a really good lawyer. He's uh, a perfect, and very popular within the Likud among the voters too. Very it? popular within the Likud and in general on the right, putting the lie to this this idea that somehow the gay community is going to be completely demolished by this right wing government. Uh, he's friends with all these these right wingers and religious people. So anyway, if Amir, I think maybe that. Netanyahu was considering Amir Ohana for this job, not only because Amir is smart and attractive, but, you know, having somebody, a member of the LGBT uh, community, be the Israel's face to the international community that has been screaming about this new government, it might not be such a, a, um, a, a stupid move, let's put it that way. So that's How a is his English? Because I don't... Uh, I think is, his is English he, is good. Uh, I think his English is good. Um, then there's also Yariv Levine, who he he's also was very high up. He had a very high place in the Likud primary, and he's another candidate. Also, Amir Ohana has been considered for Speaker of the Knesset. There are all kinds of jobs going on, and it's very complicated right now because there are many people vying for the same portfolios. But the one person you and I haven't spoken about yet right now is Itamar Ben Gvir, the famous bogeyman who has taken who who has become the celebrity of this election. 
So Itamar Ben-Gvir said all along that he wants to be public security minister. That is the ministry that is, the police is in that purview. And a lot of people said, no, he can't do that. He's a loose cannon. He'll just go around killing people or something. But the fact is, it seems that he's getting it. And everybody seems to have uh, accepted that, that that's the one he wanted. And Netanyahu said, fine. And the reason I'm saying that, even though nothing is finalized, is because he's already met with the chief of police. Everyone is already talking about him as though he's already become the public security minister. Yeah. There's lots of ironies there because the police used to be chasing him um, or, you know, harassing yes. him uh, during his uh, yes. activist period. And you know, he's a prominent defense lawyer for people being, you know, uh, uh, prosecuted, uh, you know, by, 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 the, by the police. Um, but that's not the first time in history somebody with that kind of background has taken over uh, the, the government power. But he's certainly very controversial and um, it's sort of, you know, he's set up to uh, either have a great success and prove that, you know, everybody was wrong about him or, you know, crash and burn, which is in a job that hasn't always, um, you know, proved to be, um, you know, a good ride for most of the people who've had it. No, that's why most people don't want that job. <laughs> okay. By yeah, the way, you can actually, if the crime doesn't go down, people are going to blame you. You know, exactly. It's a way to measure. Way, it's not if just you're, that you're a minister job. of various, if you're minister of agriculture or transportation, it's not so <laughs> easy right. to hold you accountable. That's if, right. you're the, if you're the police minister, you know. They do <laughs> not want that job because you can't win in a way. That's one. Two is that, um, that. You know, my biggest fear, I've been in this country so many decades and I've seen so many, many of these elections and coalitions and all this, that I would tell the people who are panicked about Ben Gvir and, you know, his extremism, that we, we have more to fear of his suddenly turning left than we do of his being a fascist fanatic. That's well, all I'm saying. It's um, tough to turn around a, gov a government bureaucracy. Um, That's you know, one Israel, thing. Like, yeah. like most yes. democracies, has you know what we call it, some people call it the deep state, the administrative state, the civil and service. And Israel has it in spades. Um, That's true. Right. The bureaucracy, the government bureaucracy has a mind of its own, and it's, it's, a, you know, it's a big ship that's very hard to turn around uh, if you're the politician you know, at the top of ministry, uh, full of people Absolutely. that... Um, only report to you in, you know, in name, but, you know, tend to do whatever they want. Absolutely. But I'll tell you one thing. One of the reasons I think that both soldiers and border police and regular blue, as you call, we call blue policemen, as opposed to green policemen, um, are, are relieved about this. Today, was, there was a sort of metaphor, the today's terrorist attack of what Ben Gvir wants to change. And here's what happened. The terrorist uh, this morning or afternoon, I can't even remember what time it happened. I think it was late morning. The terrorist was a Palestinian with a uh, permit to work in Israel, and he had been working for quite a while at Intel um, as a janitor. And he had all the right papers, and he got up to the, um, the, um, the roadblock, and he handed his papers to the guard there, and the guard looked at his papers, and then he killed the guard. He stabbed him to death. And there was another guard on duty, and that guy shot in the air, and the terrorist escaped and proceeded to kill and escaped on a, in a car and stole a car and killed two people at a gas station and then ran over somebody. Why the second guy shot in the air was the question. Why didn't he shoot right into the terrorist's head or back or something? This has been a problem where Israeli security forces on the ground are in a dilemma about what constitutes their right to shoot to kill and when they have to say halt or give a warning first. And Ben Gvir said, no more of this. I have to empower these soldiers, police, the, the police on the ground 
to shoot at the first sign of danger because otherwise they endanger themselves and it, it keeps happening. So I think a lot yeah. of them are relieved yeah. that they're going to be given the, yeah, the if, tools. Well, obviously, I think that would be popular. It will, but that's a good segue into the, you know, my, my next question to you is about what is this government's priority to, for actually legislating and, and putting in place new policy um, that has to do with its, um, you know, its attempts to sort of reform the judiciary, which is in large part responsible for the very restrictive, um, you know, rules of engagement for security personnel. Yes, well, that's one of the biggest controversies going on right now is that the whole left side of the political spectrum, including former right-wingers who are only on the left side because they hate Netanyahu, they became what they called the change block, the anti-Netanyahu block. Many of them were former Likud, or there was Lieberman, Avigdor Lieberman, who always was considered a right-winger. But why I'm bringing this up is suddenly that whole side is claiming that any reforms of the judiciary are going to harm democracy. Just the opposite is the case, right? They, what they want to do is say, we, we need an override clause that does not un enable the Supreme Court to cancel the uh, rulings, the laws enacted by the parliament, by the Knesset. There, there's a separation of powers and the courts have abused that repeatedly yeah because there there is no balance there are no check it's checks and balances but the checks are all in one direction there's no exactly check on the court's power exactly so anybody who hears how oh and the only reason they want that there's the two claims and they're lying the two claims are they only want it because the ultra orthodox don't want to serve in the army and this way they'll be able to they'll be able to maneuver that and to be this way Netanyahu can get out of his legal out of his trial that's underway. Both of these claims are false. Why are they false? Nobody is saying that Netanyahu's trial is going to stop. And the argument over the ultra-Orthodox and the amount of, of those who serve in the army, etc., it's an ongoing dispute. And the, the fact that the Supreme Court, this, the Supreme Court intervenes repeatedly in issues that are not in its purview. And absolutely, you, I mean, that's what we, ha what we elected the Knesset to do, is enact laws and not to have them just di dismissed by a group of judges who, by the way, um, appoint themselves, their friends and themselves and one another. Let's, that's another huge issue right now is how judges are appointed. Right. There's no check on them that way. Nope. And they're also not ruling from a written constitution. Israel you know, doesn't have that's a written right. constitution. That's right. And that's a bigger problem. Yes. So, so basically, when they make their rulings, you know, um, enforcing what we would call judicial review over Knesset legislation, they're not citing specific laws that, you know, are basic. You know, they're, they're not doing it based, well, this is unconstitutional because it violates this or that provision of the constitution. It's just because they said, well, this is bad. You know, this is bad exactly. for, for Israel. It's, it's bad for human rights um, as they exactly. themselves define it rather than, you know, citing another real source. Exactly. So, you know, this is a fight. And the truth is that Netanyahu never said we have to just cancel this and cancel that and, and fire the, the, the attorney general and, and change everything. No. He, um, he, he's actually the most moderate among the people who want reforms of the judicial system, okay? Uh, but the fact is that the scaremongering on the part of the left and the anybody but BB crowd, the scaremongering is outrageous. And the reason it's outrageous is that some of those very people screaming how it's going to be an end to democracy used to support it when they were, when five minutes ago, before they decided that Netanyahu was the devil incarnate. So yeah. it's... Well, speak, speaking of, you know, this sort of uh, the, the never BB crowd in Israel. Yes. Um, you know, Netanyahu was, was, you know, he was prime minister for three years in the 90s, then 12 straight years from 2009 yeah. to 2021. 
now after about a year and a half break, during which he, you know, he wrote his uh, autobiography and, uh, you know, prepared the way for the next election. He's now back in power. How, what is net? What is you know Netanyahu chapter three or you know however many chapters where we're gonna you know whatever number chapter you want to call this? How will it be different from you know past uh, terms for for him? What what will be different about this time for for Netanyahu or will it just be you know as if uh, you know everybody just woke up from June twenty twenty one and just like it can you know turn the page. You know how how has he changed? Will he change? You know what, what 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 do you think he might do differently, if at all? Well, for one thing, he's got a different kind of coalition. It's a very unprecedented one, so that already means that he he can't be the same Netanyahu under these under different circumstances. But if what he's doing is planning for his legacy whether this is his last four years or eight years, or we don't, we don't know. I can't predict how long he. Well, he, you know, on. we've both, we, we've, we've talked about this before. I mean, he, you know, he has survived when nobody thought he would survive, including at times me. I mean, I'll fully right. admit that it, right. there have been, there have been times, I think a lot, almost at, at one point or another, I think just about everybody has said, well, that that's it, you know, but it's never it for Netanyahu. But Correct. And there's also, a reason for that. There's a reason for that. You know, but, but, you know, it's like he doesn't have, you know, he didn't groom his successor. He doesn't seem to believe in the no. concept. So, you know, I don't know. He seems on. to be, excuse me. First of all, he seems to be grooming Ron Dermer, if you ask me, but that's another issue. Okay. That's just, you know, mm -hmm. sure. but, but, but you're right. He didn't groom a successor. He has his flaws, but it's no accident that he's the longest serving prime minister in Israel, in, in Israel's history. He is also a genius at long-term strategy. And he said all along, way before anybody believed him, that, that you have to make that you don't need the Palestinians in order to make peace with the Arab world. And he showed everybody that was true with the Abraham Accords. Meanwhile, given what's going on in Iran, it's possible that he will decide to take actual, you know, serious action and not just uh, targeted assassinations or uh, bombings of Iranian bases in Syria. You know, these are these mini strikes. It's possible that especially given the protest movement in Iran right now that his, you know, has not died down and they really need outside support. And Netanyahu is no dummy. You think he doesn't know, he, he didn't see the results of the midterms, that there was no red wave there, and that mm. Biden is still Which president. we'll get to in a couple of minutes, yeah. Right, so, you right. know, it's very possible he'll have to act, he'll, Israel will have to act on its own, and that will have to be done by him, and he might not do that either. But what I'm saying is if if he's seeing his... His, his career winding down, even if it'll take a few years, and he sees his legacy, I think he will make peace with more neighbors uh, I th and, um, and, be, you know, and try to repair the damage to the economy that's been done and try to restore governance to especially the Negev, but also to East Jerusalem, etc. I think that a lot of damage was done by this, this hash posh what do you call hodgepodge, excuse me, uh, coalition that's outgoing. Yeah. So uh, let's brief, you know, just briefly before we move on to discussing, you know, what's next in the United States. Um, one of the issues that's certainly getting a lot of notice in the United States, certainly in the Jewish community, were the calls by some of the religious parties to change the law of return, um, you know, to, you know, change it from the traditional sort of based on what happened, what the Nazis did, if you had a Jewish grandparent, you have a right to come to Israel because if you had right. a Jewish grandparent, you know, you could be slaughtered exactly. by, by like the, the Nazis. Like the Nuremberg laws, right. Exactly. Um, is, that, is that something that Netanyahu is going to let happen? And how far, you know, will he let his partners go or can they go um, when, you know, it's not clear that that's something that, you know, is, is certainly you know, one of his priorities? Look, he certainly doesn't agree with that. That's for sure. Okay, he 
that's not his view of the situation. As I said before, I think that a lot of these statements being made by different Orthodox uh, members of this coalition are almost like you could say bargaining chips. It's almost like they're going to throw out their their uh, their dream scenario and whatever sticks, whatever they're able to achieve in that. Um, okay, good, right? Now, I don't believe that the law of return is going to change. Uh, I don't believe that grandfather clause will pass uh, the Knesset and I don't think it'll pass the majority of this coalition either. I don't believe it. There are other things, for example, the issue of uh, conversions and whether reform conversions are real conversions. And there, you know, I don't know. There's going to be a big battle. But the one thing that I personally don't care about, I know Netanyahu does, however, is how the diaspora will react. And the reason I don't care is that the diaspora has not been loyal for the most part. And as a result, I say, well, really? I mean, I feel a little bit, I say, really? Okay, they're Jews and they are, they have the right to live in Israel and they have the right to express all their views about Israel and reform, conservative, orthodox, whoever they are. But they're siding very often with Israel's enemies and apologizing for certain forms of of anti-Israel rhetoric and anti-Semitism, and that goes for the Anti-Defamation League and other Jewish groups. I personally don't care what they think about our legislation about conversion. Well, I would. Uh, I understand that sentiment, and you know your your critique. Certainly, um, I'm. You know, as as you know, <laughs> I'm very critical of the ADL and and uh, most of everything that it does under its current administration and uh, and leader. Um, I think the, the response to that is, you may be right that many liberal American Jews are not particularly supportive of Israel. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't really advance the cause of Israel to, you know, basically give them the finger, um, you know, and it doesn't, doesn't really help that much. You could say, well, who cares? Well, I think it's Netanyahu's job to care. I think it's, I, I don't think it really... Me, no, um, no, no, wait a second. As, Let me as, put as, it as divided way. as... Mm -hmm. Okay, but let me put it another way. How many diaspora Jews who underwent reform conversions, how many of those are actually making Aliyah, immigrating to Israel? A small number. You're absolutely actually, right. Very, very few, but it's a symbolic so issue. Because it is symbolic. That, that, and I know, the, that the Netanyahu, of, of, I know that Netanyahu cares very much about that. Because Netanyahu is not only a statesman, he's a diplomat. He knows what's going on. He knows the score. And he cares about American Jews in particular. I mean, there are Jews in Europe as well. But I mean, America is the diaspora. North America is the key diaspora. And I know he cares about that. And so I'm not really worried. But I, my, I was making a point about how, okay, it's a symbolic gesture. But when you get down to the nitty gritty of it and who's actually affected by such a, a law, it's so minuscule. OK, because, you know, that you're absolutely so, right. Yeah. It affects very few people, but it is something that, you know, will be noticed by a very large number of people who are affiliated yes. with the reform movement in the United States, right. which is the largest um, in terms of, right. uh, you know, members and uh, people who uh, affiliate one way or another with it. Forty percent of perhaps of, of all those who affiliate with a denomination, which is a category which is uh, which is shrinking. Already, you know, since right. Jews of no religion is the largest, you know, is the fastest growing category of American Jews. But right, I, you know, there I think we'll have to agree to disagree. And I think uh, I think you're right. I don't. And think luckily that's for you, will, luckily for will, you, I'm not the prime minister of Israel or a minister or even a Knesset member. I'm just I don't think you really have such a great time uh, doing that, Ruthie. We need we need <laughs> you writing as a you're a great journalist. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I don't think either of us is journalists. We don't want to be politicians. Uh, there are meat. Uh, we don't want to be join them. Yeah, exactly. Um, speaking of politicians, let's um, sort of shift our view for a moment and to the election that we just had in the United States last week. Um, the returns are finally being sorted out. It would appear it's clear that the Democrats have held on to the Senate, um, which is not entirely surprising. But you know, there was no red wave. Uh, a lot of the polls were wrong about the Republicans doing better. And the Republicans are appear to 
have a majority in the House of Representatives, but an incredibly tiny majority and not, you know, the big verdict they were they were hoping for. Um, that's going to have a lot of impact on, on many things, uh, policy here, um, but it's also going to have an impact on, on uh, U.S.-Israel relations because um, there is not going to be the effective check on the Biden administration that a Republican Senate would have provided. And um, I think if uh, Netanyahu thinks he's going to be invited, as some people have even called for, um, if Netanyahu thinks he's going to be invited to speak um, to Congress by, you know, the next speak Republican Speaker of the House, if likely Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy is going to have a lot of other battles uh, to fight uh, rather than to, you know, um, so, sort of die on the hill of fighting a, a new Iran uh, deal. Um, and that's something that Netanyahu really has to cope with in that um, he's, you know, what's, what do you think the next two years of Biden and Netanyahu um, dealing with each other is going to be like? Well, first of all, they've known each other for decades. That's one thing. Um, sure. I, I prefer, listen, I was also hoping for a red wave. And I'm sure Netanyahu was too, okay? Yes. But, all right, it didn't happen. And then you have to say to yourself, is it better to have someone like Netanyahu who's, uh, who's uh, got more Republican support than Democrat? In, in power and his right-wing government in such a situation and under such circumstances? Or is it better to have a liberal government like the outgoing one in Israel, um, which is more in line with Democrat, the Democratic Party? And my feeling is that we gave them a chance to be in line with the Democrats, and there was a lot of nice lip service back and forth, lots of chummy-chummy warm handshakes, but it didn't do anything to stop the criticism that was lodged by the United States at Israel. It didn't stop the travesty of the reopening of the investigation into the Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera journalist's death, Shirin Abu Akleh, by the FBI opening an investigation of a case that was and should have been closed there, the kind of hostility or, or underlying hostility of the Democratic Party to Israel or, or it's having a dim view of certain Israeli policies it didn't change with having Lapid or Bennett or all of these appeasers in government in Israel. So I would prefer to have Netanyahu, who knows what he's doing. And he also knows how to to talk nice to the Democrats. So what? What's important is what he does and how he, how he uh, steers the ship through those muddy waters in Washington. Yeah, well, it's definitely going to be muddier, or at least um, you know, more turbulent waters um, for, for Israel. Um, yeah. I guess one of the things that we're, we've all, I think those of us who follow this, have been wondering what will... The administration, the Biden administration, do now that the midterms are over, are they going to renew? I mean, everything I have heard is that they're going to be renewing their efforts to try and get Iran to sign some sort of deal um, to let the oil flow from Iran, um, which is a very big deal for, for this administration with gas prices um, being a big issue. Will be you know with the war in Ukraine being their real priority, um, you know that that's that is you know the the number one foreign policy issue for 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 this administration. Not anything going on in the Middle East, not the Iran threat, not let alone the peace process, which obviously frustrates the Palestinians because Biden, you know, you can say what you like about Biden's foreign policy team, but even they know that the Palestinians are never going to make peace, and it's a waste of time for them to expend any political capital on that. Right, but don't they, but here's what I don't get, okay? I understand, listen, I'm no fan of Democrats, okay? So, but let me, let me get this straight. They care about the Ukrainians who are, who, you know, Russia, Russia's illegal invasion and attacks and, and terrible crimes that Russia committed against innocent Ukrainians. Okay, fine. But don't they see what has happened to the Iranian people do they want to strengthen that evil regime 
that is gunning down protesters and slaughtering women and imprisoning people. And, the, and in spite of that, this time the demonstrations are continuing. And those brave people and what, what B the Biden administration wants to do is appease the regime and give it more money. It's, it is so immoral that there are no words to describe it. Yeah, well, I, I think you're absolutely right. But yes, that is what their intention <laughs> appears to be. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's very self-interested on the part of the United States is that um, the administration, you know, number one, it believes in the idea of rapprochement with the Iranian regime, as you know. It's always th this group of people in power, Robert Malley, Wendy Sherman, <laughs> the whole, you know, uh, Anthony, yeah. Blink Anthony Blinken, you know, they believe in the idea of, of a rapprochement with Iran. That's why they were part of the Obama foreign policy team, they've continued it. They were very frustrated by Iran's, you know, basically playing them for saps and refusing to, to sign on the dotted line um, with, with a new Iran deal, a new weaker, more dangerous Iran deal. Um, they, uh, you know, I, perhaps they think they can get an even better deal now, but they their priority is to get the oil flowing. They don't, they're, you know, as much as they may pay lip service to the protests, um, clearly, they don't have any confidence that the Iranian regime uh, will be toppled or can be toppled. Um, um, obviously, there's some debate within the people who really know about Iran. You know, you're somebody who follows that issue closely. Um, do you think they're right that you know this regime can just weather this indefinitely, and that you know basically Biden is placing his 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 money by putting his money on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as opposed to the protesters? Well, look, I've heard from some Iran experts, I'm not an Iran expert, but I've heard for, from some and some who are Farsi speakers that there are similarities between these protests and the ones that took place that ousted the Shah in uh, 1979. And now, so that's one thing. The other thing is that many uh, that members of the the Islamic Revolu Revolutionary Guard Corps, some of them have absconded, have gotten their money and 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 left for the West. There were airplanes taking members of the regime out of the country. Now, so does that mean this regime is about to fall? No. But it sure shows signs of cracking in a way that hasn't been seen before. So, you know, obviously I'm thinking, well, so what we need to do is help it along in some way, you know, and you can't help that along by strengthening the bad guys. You know, you, I, I'm not an expert on how you help the protesters. I know part of it has to do with keeping their internet running and all kinds of other things that I don't even know about, you know, maybe we even have Mossad agents on the ground there. I don't know, but I do know that the- Well, I, the I, I bet that Mossad has, has a better handle on it than the CIA. I'll just, you know, that will- Oh, for sure. Oh, there's sense. no question about that. No question whatsoever that it has a better handle on it. But, you know, if you have the United States of America going against it, it's just, it, it's really Sisyphean, you know? So- it's a shame, terrible shame. Um, part of um, you know the the interesting dynamic of the post midterm uh, debate in the United States, you know, has been, there's been a lot of um, you know finger pointing among Republicans. As much as Democrats have been doing touchdown dances, Republicans have been uh, doing finger pointing, and a lot of the fingers are pointing on somebody who is still pretty popular in Israel. That is former President Donald Trump who was just honored by the Zionist Organization of America um, the other night, um, and who is may well be about to declare for the presidency again. Um, you know, that sets up all kinds of interesting, you know, um, dynamics because, you know, other pro-Israel figures within the Republican Party are also likely to run for president. Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, who was the big Republican winner from the midterms and who is... You know, Frank, you know, he's very pro-Israel himself, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, former Vice President Mike Pence. Um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, but Trump still has, you know, the loyalty of a lot of his followers, even though, you know, certainly he has uh, his stock has gone down in the last, uh, you know, recently because of some bad picks for candidates that he did and the way he seems to be, 
at war with his own party. Um, what's the Israeli perspective on, you know, sort of uh, Trump chapter three or, you know, whatever chapter we're, we're doing on, you know, his efforts and the way he is basically calling in his chits and saying that it's everybody who is pro-Israel, it's their obligation to be not just supporting his side, but supporting him personally. Yeah, well, I think that in Israel, first of all, because Israel has been very sort of, uh, um, you know, steeped in these elections and a repeat of elections, what the divide here is similar to the divide in the United States in relation to Trump. I mean, the conservatives, you know, the right wingers here are very, very pro-Trump and the left is, you know, more hesitant about it. They don't necessarily hate him so much, but, you know, he's he's on the wrong side as far as they're concerned. But here's the thing with Trump. Well, they hate him at um, Haaretz, that's for sure. Oh, they loathe him at Haaretz and most other papers. But the among the people who really, you know, said he ought to be prime minister, there's still plenty of those. However, his behavior during the midterms lost him a lot of brownie points. And that isn't because he picked the wrong candidates, not merely because he picked the wrong ones. Okay. It's because of his behavior towards people who are popular, even in his own base. So if you use DeSantis as an example, I mean, he's the, he's the best example. DeSantis, you know, up in, that Trump should attack DeSantis was stupid. Okay, I don't care how he feels about him, but he was behaving as though they were both on stage running in a primary, which they weren't, okay? And for him to attack DeSantis as though he's some horrible guy when he's such a popular Republican, and he's certainly closer to being a MAGA Republican than any than a rhino. Indeed, he is. I mean, he speaks up for yeah, these so, issues. So, issues that so Trump saying there would about. be no DeSantis without me is childish and foolish. And by the way, this doesn't take away from my view that ZOA did the right thing by giving him by honoring him. He deserves it. What he did for Israel, no other president has done in the history of the U.S. I. There is there is no way we can ever repay him, in a sense, for that. And there was just one move after the other that was sort of jaw-dropping. But that doesn't mean that now we should watch him destroy the, the remnants of the Republican Party, at least the, the, the part that his base likes, to destroy it from within. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it, it just makes no sense other than his crazy ego. Well, uh, clearly the attacks on DeSantis are because DeSantis has not disavowed, you know, DeSantis never declared for, for the presidency. He has made no, no made no statement towards that, but he has not disavowed the fact that he will run, you know, that the, the idea that he might run. And Trump views that as les majeste. I mean, and that's, that's the way he views all of these, um, you know, uh, transactions. It's, you know, it's just about him. It's not about the issues. It's whether you're personally supporting him. And the truth is, as you know, as I see, you know, from my own Twitter feed, anytime when I've written about this, as I have, there are a lot of people not maybe you know, certainly not. I don't think the majority of Republicans, but a critical mass of them that says that anybody who will not, you know, sort of bend the knee to Donald Trump in whatever way Donald Trump wants is a rhino, is a leftist, is a bad person. A traitor. Um, I know. And I know. And and yeah, the I'm fact is, um, you know, it's very hard to imagine him accepting a primary loss if indeed, you know, he has to fight for the nomination. And he almost certainly will have to fight for it because DeSantis at this point pretty much has to run. Trump has more or less dared him. And I think he will and other people will. Um, Trump certainly would go into it with the largest amount of support, but it's hard to imagine him accepting a loss or not basically blowing up the Republican Party if it doesn't nominate him for president. Yeah, no, no, that's terrible. And here's the only reason DeSantis might not run is the reason, the original reason that he might not have declared that he's going to run, not just because he didn't want to get on Trump's bad side, but from what I've heard from people I don't know, donors to his campaign in Florida, for example, that he vowed to his base to remain governor of Florida, at least for another four years. You know, the, the election, in, the presidential election is only two years away, right? So 
um, and he's done so much for Florida and they're kind of, his base doesn't want him to jump ship just yet because, you know, to establish Florida as the best state in the country, he needs yeah, a little the, more time. the capital time. of red state America, yes. Yeah. The free state of Florida. And he needs Florida. a little more time. So his, his fans are not that anxious. His fans in Florida, I mean, are not that anxious yeah. to have him run for president because they want him as their governor. So I, don't, well, I honestly, yeah. you know, I don't know. Uh, my bet, and I think, you know, you and I, we could, you know, we can, uh, we'll, we'll see who's right. Right now, I believe that Trump's insults of DeSantis have, have you know, put it in a position. Um, you know, there are reasons why he might or might, might run or might not run. There are good reasons for him not to run, and I, we've already stated some of them. But, you know, right now, the momentum, he'll never be more popular, more, more have more momentum behind him. Yeah. Four years from now, eight years from now, he's a very young man. Certainly, he could, you know, he could wait. But, you know, there is a, you know, uh, as... This may be his moment. 2024 may be his best chance. And things change in politics very quickly. And I think Trump's insults have kind of um, gotten the dander up of even some of DeSantis's uh, fans. And uh, I, I think we're, we're heading towards, uh, you know, sort of Armageddon between them and, and other Republicans. And that's, that's an interesting thing because these are all friends of Israel and they will be having at it in a way um, you know, that certainly I, I think um, would be destruct destructive of their ultimate chances, but I don't see any way around um, sort of a, um, you know, a battle over this. I think Trump has, uh, has you know, it's kind of made this the, the inevitable outcome here, and um, I have no idea how it will turn out. And I know that people who are Trump loyalists, you know, are, get very angry at the thought of anybody challenging him and you although although i've that. noticed on social media just a minute i noticed on my facebook feed uh and on twitter people who are some serious pro-trump people and in a in a a group called you know jews for trump and this for trump and that for trump saying exactly what i just said that you're, you nobody's done a better job for the country and for israel and for everything but you have gone too far with attacking DeSantis and you should, and you know, maybe it's time for you to step aside. I've seen that yeah. more and more from serious Trump supporters. So I, I don't I, know. I've seen some of that and I've seen some, some angry pro-Trump uh, posts yes. as well. Yes, yes, um, for sure. We'll, we'll see sure. how it turns out. Now, um, do you think the, he's about to announce mm -hmm. something tonight, right? Or today? I mean, I don't know. That's, oh, I'm in Israel. Yeah, so it's it night. will be, it will happen before this, this podcast is, is, uh, right. is so, out with the public. You know, so the funny part is. We're speaking was, in, in ignorance of what he's going to say, but. Exactly. You know, uh, it, but but mm -hmm. the funny part is I was thinking. An announcement, but I have a surprise, his saying, I'm going to have a surprise announcement. So the assumption is he's going to announce that he's running. But that's not a surprise. I would say the surprise would be if he announced that he's not running and he's supporting, I don't know, DeSantis or somebody. <laughs> that to me would be the surprise um, announcement. Well, I think, I, I think I would... I think I've got a bridge in Brooklyn and many other localities to sell you if you think that's what's going to happen. <laughs> we'll, yeah, no. We'll, I we'll don't see what we'll see it. what happens. I don't Ruthie, believe it. I want to Yes, Ruthie, I want to thank you for coming on. This was a great conversation as always. Thanks, Jonathan, as um, always. Thanks for your insights. Um we'll have you back again soon. Uh though there's great. always more to talk about. Um we want to thank our audience as well whether you're um watching us on JNS TV, on uh, YouTube or on JBS TV, watching us live on Facebook or Twitter or listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms. Please like this podcast, give it good reviews, uh, click on the bell for notifications, write to us at editor at JNS.org and let us know where you listen and watch the show and what you think about it. And also tune in every day on Spotify and the other podcast platforms for Top Story Daily Edition. And thank you. Well, remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.